、こちら。Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the last segment of the day of UI Path Forward 2024 here in Las Vegas. I'm Rebecca Knight, and I'm surrounded by analysts. I'm here with Dave Vellante, my co host and analyst, and Andy Turai, a good friend of theCUBE, who, of course, is the VP of Constellation Research.、Uh, so, we've heard a lot today.、Uh, we're in. The According to Daniel Dunez, it's the start of Act Two for this company. The future,、uh, the future is agentic automation.、Mm -hmm. Are you picking up what they're putting down? I mean, I'm, I'm curious. What, what's, your, what's your initial take on, on, today's, on, on, on today's messaging? Yeah,、um, first of all, thank you for having me here.、Um, so, in a sense, I do buy that Act Two because. Remember a few years ago, they were like the hot game in the town, and when the IPO came out, they were like hit, you know, went blew through the roof. And then after that, they slowed down a little bit. Last couple of years, you know, you, you look at all these other companies releasing the agentic things, automation things, and then they kind of lost their mojo. But there are a couple of things they announced here, which we'll talk in detail. They announced that that's going to, or at least their vision wise, I don't know about their execution yet. I haven't seen because it's all just generally made available, or at least in the news、uh, area level, I mean, announcement level.、Um, but their vision has changed. Instead of doing more of robotic automation platforms, now they're interested in talking about agents and providing a platform for agents and also for multimodal combination. That, I think, is, is the difference they are bringing to the market. So I, I feel like, as you said at the, at the beginning, <laughs> It's Act Two, yes, but, it's, but it's, Act One was RPA, and it was really, you know, bots, software robots, you know, speed,、uh, kind of single product, really wasn't a platform, as Andy says now. And then Act One A, which if, they, if, if we could call this Act Three, I'd be okay with it, but Act One A was the expansion into a platform. So they bought. Process Gold, and which brought you know, Process Mining. They made a number of other acquisitions,、uh, a couple of little AI tuck ins,、um, and they built out a platform. And that was an important part of the transformation from product to platform. And it did, UiPath has always been good at marketing. So it went from RPA to hyper automation、um, and intelligent automation, and now it's agentic. It's, in, it's interesting. Because not only UiPath, but other RPA companies try to distance themselves from RPA、uh, because it was like, oh, that's passe. We got to define the hot new thing. Let's get IDC to define a new category or Gartner, right? You know how that, that works. It's good marketing. But now I think they're realizing actually RPA is important, it's, it's the foundation, it's the plumbing. You know, Daniel Dinez in his keynote and also in the Cube was saying, you need bots to work in concert with agents because you can't fully trust the agents. Let the bots do the if then else, you know, rules based work and let the agents, you know, get creative, you know, left brain, right brain type of thing. And so it's, it's interesting to me, Andy, that they're kind of, and Rebecca, that they're kind of going back to their roots, which I think is smart because it is the plumbing. Now, the question is, Whether or not that is you know, leverageable into the next wave and how they can execute on that. And we should talk about it.、Uh, let me, so the point you made about the fact that you know, the, the robots versus you know, agents. That's one of the areas where most of the RPA systems they are really good at and yet fail, in my view, is that it can automate what can be automated, which means those are deterministic systems. Which、yeah. means when a decision is made, you know 100% of the time it's the same decision that's going to make. So it is easy to automate and do automation of a robot and then leave it at that point. But now, for the first time ever, the probabilistic decision making engines are making its way into the enterprise. So when you put that in the automation scheme, it's not just about the agents, it's about the platform, it's about the workflow, it's about the ecosystem. There's a lot more involved in that. And that's where I think they are set up. I mean, are they going to win it? I don't know the answer to it, but they are set up. With the components around it for them to go for the Act Two. Well, they're going after the, what we called in that piece, I think you picked up on it, the, the, the agent、um, uh, uh, framework, right?、Um, and that's a very valuable piece of real estate in the new software st stack, that agent control framework.、Uh, they've got back end connectors into,、mm -hmm. you know, name it, SAP and Salesforce and Oracle and, you know, through APIs. And they, 
say it's 2A. You don't have to like copy the data, stick it into a data lake, and then it becomes another asynchronous system. I don't, I'm still not clear, I've asked the question a lot today, how do you harmonize all that data? I'm still unclear on how they do that, what the technology is to do that, whether it's UiPath or is it some knowledge graph company like relational AI or maybe some of the modern data platforms or do they have to invent that layer? But it's very clear they've got orchestration capabilities that they're doubling down on. They also have low code chops, which I think is important to really drive productivity and they're, they're taking a system view, which is also important. What are your thoughts? Well, yes, but in my view, the, when it comes to the, the, the decision-making engine, again, going back to that, you know, the deterministic system versus agent take. Yep. Right now, they are on a level that, you know, you know exactly what to call, that's why you can call. But then going forward, they're bringing to the, the possibility of Okay, you know what? I don't know what decision need to be done. I don't know what the system of record is. I don't know what action need to be taken. At this point, let me, they didn't talk about this particularly, but there are a couple of other companies I'm advising that I spoke with. What they are suggesting is, I don't know the action to take at this point of my workflow. Let me even bid out to the agents saying that, hey agents, I got a series of agents in my agentic workplace, in my agentic marketplace, 20, 40, 100 of them. You know what? Let me ask you, let me bid it out and say that which one of you is capable of doing this job so that dynamic workflow manipulation, that hasn't happened to date with anybody. That potential I saw here today. Are they going to win it? I don't know an answer to that. But, but, but you see a path forward. I see a path forward towards that, you know, saying that I can manipulate my message workflow. It doesn't have to be that static. It could be dynamic, it could be manipulated. So to me, the data piece is still fuzzy. I, I don't, and, and I'm <laughs> trying to understand if, in fact, it's just somebody else's role or they've got it figured out. It's, it's unclear to me. So I'll park that. Mm -hmm. um, this idea of the, it's kind of the next best action, I think they are set up because they can do step by step. They have step by step uh, um, awareness and, and they can govern those steps. And they have process. Yep. They, can, they can, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's immature in terms of the agentic embedding but they understand process. UiPath has good process chops, right? And that's important. It's, there's data, there's metadata, there's there's business governance, logic, governance, and, and you got to govern that. There's yeah. security, and there's also process, right? That's that's something that um, is going to become increasingly important because these processes are going to be uh, um, um, organic. They, 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 there's a lot of processes that are going to just uh, become reinvented and to think about how you did you know bpm in the past you'd get around a whiteboard and you'd get these big books with sort of all the diagrams right that's not where the problem is right because matter of fact no, it's an opportunity for them is what i'm saying it's a lot of guys don't exactly have opportunity for them because yeah. agents are smallest possible ai work decision making execution engines they could have that you could drop it in the workflow that'll work but their problem is going to be, you know, if you looked at that, there are a lot of companies that are coming with the larger action models, the uh, LAMs. Yeah. The LAMs and the thinking models, um, thinking generative AI models, that's going to be their biggest problem because what they are trying to do is to replace this entire workflow. You don't have to do any, the workflow is rigid. That's where the problem is, right? So what these guys are trying to do is that you don't have to do any of that give me the data or point me where the data is, tell me what needs to be done, I will figure it out using my... I'll tell you what the workflow should be. The best, the best possible workflow. Exactly. The, the other thing, is, and Daniel brought this up, is, is you know, yes, the, the orchestrating, orchestrating the agents is one thing, but it's really the ability to, to, to tap into the tooling, to leverage tooling. Yep. And multiple tools, understanding the right tool for the right job, working in concert with other agents, seems to be, what he feels anyway, is the advantage. And he doesn't think the UI is going to go away. Exactly, right. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually curious to hear what you thought of the product announcements because we, we're, we're here at a conference, this is what they do. They announce, they announce new products and services. One that caught my eye was Agent Builder and, yeah. and sort of in, in, yeah. in service of this idea of democratizing how, how this technology is built. What are some of the others that, that caught your eye that you find most interesting, Andy? The agent builder is actually a pretty big deal because if you are to think about it, there are two things that stood out to me. One, giving a component to build the agents more on a low code, no code basis. 
And not only that you can build the agents from ground up, let's say if you're a business person and you don't understand the technology that much, you can take one of the existing models, they are also talking about the agentic marketplace, where they'll have hundreds if not thousands of agents available. You will take an agent and say that, okay, some of this will work for me, but I want to modify it a little bit. So you could build agents on top of existing agents. That one stood out to me, right? You could, you could modify. The second one, I didn't realize that, they have, what is that, three million um, citizen developers that they have who can build models. So imagine putting the platform in front of them, have the three million people go at it to build models, agents. I mean, that would outstrip any of the existing agent model builders today. So that is a pretty big deal in my view. And, and, and also you talked about, uh, that I thought was a bold statement. You said, what, the three billion use cases, potential use cases, what they're exploring? I thought that was mind blowing, that just a little high made up number. But, <laughs> but I mean, the potential is there, yeah. potential is there. And then um, they announced some relationships with LLM vendors, so they own yeah. uh, Anthropic and Inflection, which is interesting because you know people think, oh, Inflection, aren't they now part of Microsoft? And no, they're sort of reformatting their business to focus on, you said, large action models, maybe small, uh, small language models and and domain specific models is what Inflection's going after. So that's kind of interesting, and that fits with UiPath, you know, the industry specificity. Um, I have, you know, you were at IBM with me last week. I think IBM and UiPath would make really interesting partners. Now their SVP of partners said, well, we're, we are partnering with IBM, but they're not like super visible here. I, I think that yeah. UiPath as a, as, a, as a consumer of LLMs with granite, the granite models that were just announced, but also Watson as a potential, you know, as an ISV, they could take advantage of that. Um, and the companies like IBM, certainly others here, we, we heard from, uh, from Deloitte and there's a, you know, Cognizant is out here. The GSIs have you know, that industry specificity. I think that's going to be a big differentiator for organizations. It's the ability to leverage their own proprietary data. Well, so, you know, I talked about this multiple times. The first wave of winners when the AI came out were the, were the infrastructure and the picks and uh, folks providers, right? Pitch folks providers. GP NVIDIA's NVIDIA providers, the networking providers, the yeah. storage providers, the infrastructure providers. Yeah. They won that. They made a ton of money off of that. Then the next wave, surprisingly, is not the model makers as everybody thinks. They burn a lot of money, but they don't make enough well, money. I'm wondering how they're going to make right. money. They it was clear. eventually might. But yeah. the next wave is the the AI experts, the advisors, the, the consulting companies on advising companies on how to do that. That's the second wave that won out. The third wave, when it comes to, because the first two are more on a conceptual level, model training and all that. But implementing the right use cases when it comes down to it, in my mind, the companies that are building the platforms are going to win. IBM is an example you brought up. And you know, UiPath is one industry specific platforms or examples that people can bring out with add on value to that. That's the wave that's going to win. And I, and I think it's the ISVs like a UiPath uh, that, that can partner mm -hmm. with GSIs to go industry specific, but then provide horizontal capabilities across virtually any industry and, and multiple use cases, because that's, they're trying to scale, it's software economics, All right? Well, we, we talked a lot about use cases here today on theCUBE. We had different companies, we had uh, different industries represented, healthcare, banking, um, contact, contact centers. Co contact right. centers, exactly. So w when you think about the ways in which this new future of agentic AI is, is going to transform industry, does what comes to mind in the sense of the industry that is going to change the most? I mean, to, for me, just watching is healthcare. 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 It's healthcare, yeah. it's yeah. just so exciting. I, I, was, I was going to say it was going to, but still, yes and no. I okay. mean, the problem with healthcare is one, for a reason, it's, it's closed. They, they, the players in there, they don't want anybody else to come in. That's issue one. Hmm. Issue two, it's also, we talked about this multiple times, you can have a probabilistic decision-making engine such as AI make a final decision on healthcare. It's not going to happen. I mean, how could you have a 50, 70, 80, even a 90% capable uh, probability? And, and the funny thing is, as I was reading one of the, I think it was a HBR article that I was reading through it, 
AI every single time with its probabilistic decision engine is a lot more accurate than any of the doctors you go to or any of the the, the MRI and you know um, the, the those people you go to. But still, people are like, no, that's a human versus AI. So again, going back to my original point, we are at the level we are argumenting humans with AI. That's going to be there for a while. Is it going to be next two years, five years, ten years? I don't, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. But eventually, the ones that are going to win are the ones that are going to argument AI with humans. In other words, you will have a semi-automated or as much automated AI agents as possible. When there is an issue, as they were showing one of the demo, when there is an issue, the AI will pop out saying that, you know what, I'm not confident in this particular decision. You take care of it. The rest of it falls within my bound, you know, boundaries you have given me. I'm going to work on it. What do you make of um, totally change the subject here, causal AI. Okay. You know, you know Scott Hebner, this is, he's hot on causal AI. Um, it's a new term for a lot of yeah. people. You know this stuff really well. What's your take on um, how real it is, how important it is? It depends on which vendor you talk to, right? I mean, casual AI, trustworthy AI, responsible AI, all of these topics are, a lot of people talk in vagueness. A lot of people talk about some meaning to it. it. It's not about, you know, what what they talk about, it's about what they implement. There are some players that are getting in there. At the end of the day, it's not about the results, what do you get out of that? It's about, you know, the have having a process that's trustworthy from the beginning. It's about your data collection. You know, that's where the, the whole issue is hung up on even now. Remember the New York Times is showing one of the other LM vendors now. Are you, Supreme Court or some high courts need to make a decision saying that who wants the data, right? Which data is usable? If it is out there in the print or media or anywhere, is the data usable? And how much do you lock in and who should get paid? And there are some companies, Adobe is for an example, we, we and I talked yeah. about this multiple times, they do data collection more of an ethical and responsible way. They either collect only the responsible data or they pay for the data that they are collecting, which is not licensed, to, to put it in their models which is a good, noble thing, and this is not particular about uh, Adobe, but generally speaking, if you are to pay for the data, then your amount of data, what you have is going to be less, which means your model is going to be less accurate, which means you can't do that. The L equal and the LAMs, LLMs, and all of those things may not be as accurate, which means you need to move towards the SLMs, the more towards you know the, the SAMs, where you have a more specific data in certain areas, you want to train your specific model using your corporate or enterprise data. But again, it's it's a catch-22 situation. If your original base model itself is not that accurate, what's the point? But the organization is going to, to me anyway, is going to pay not for the small language model or the large language model, whatever it is. They're going to pay for the outcome of the system that allows them to extract their proprietary data and use it for competitive advantage, whatever that system is. And that's what that platform, back to platform, that's what UI paths. Well, then, then also there are a couple of vendors talked about this. IBM is one being a classic example. They always talk about this. Let's say that you train a model. All your data is in there. And then either a code decision comes in or somebody else comes in saying that, you know what, I don't want my data out there. Take it out of there. Can your model do that now? Yeah, you can. good question. Right? So there, IBM is, is pretty big on that. They are like, you know what, we are training our models. Dari Gill, that's what, you know, one on one, that's the discussion we had. We are training our models in such a way that, you know, we're going to take that out. So they are, if you look at their models, the way they are training it, their models are not humongous models of this one trillion tokens and so on and so forth. The parameters are much, much, much smaller, but again, much higher performing. So again, this, this, the whole AI large language models, it's not very mature yet. It's still evolving. I mean, what was yesterday, hot yesterday is not hot today. It changed today already. I mean, we learned about some things today. Probably tomorrow, this will be outdated. So it's changing so fast. And on, remember just about a few months ago, it's all about, you know, I get an LLM, I rag it, and I do a fine tune, yeah, rag, rag a combination yeah, of it. Yeah. That's all good and done. Now we are like, no, that's not good enough. We got to do Asians. Well, so, rag, the whole request retrieve model is, it's interesting, <laughs> but it's not, needle moving in my opinion. It's it's like a kind of a cool experiment. Whereas Agentic has the potential to because the systems of agency. The difference is one is because one is more of a content producer versus the other one is more of an actionable AI as they call it. They can do actions for you. You don't have 
you could do actions on a natural language way. Remember you and I talked about it the very first time when we had the, the AI conversation. You asked me why is it so different? It's because until now, humans were made to talk in the machine language. For the first time ever now with AI, machines are talking human language. So which means we can converse in the NLP language with them. So imagine the power you're telling an agent that there is an incident that happened in my IT system, something has gone down. You tell an agent saying that, hey, I don't know what happened, that's the incident, go figure it out. Talk to other agents, figure out what the problem is, figure out a way to fix it. Yeah. And the agent will do all the work for us and those agents yeah, around. Exactly. I get it would be amazing. I get combative with LLMs. You know, I yeah, too. I'm combative anyway, but that's I, what you're I, banned. I, I, I argue with them all the time. <laughs> yeah. I just got a message from from ChatGPT said, you know, yeah, be kick it careful. Up. Be careful, you're gonna be violating, you know, our, oh, no. our requests. Oh no. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> well, this has been this has been fun, Andy and Dave. I really appreciate it. A really good conversation. Lots more to Thanks, to unpack tomorrow at, at more of the Cube's live coverage of UI Pass Forward. So thank you both for joining me, and I hope you will join us again tomorrow when we are here again at the MGM for UI Path Forward 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis. See you tomorrow.